there have been many horrible crashes in the history of Formula 1, and with these events come both some sad but also very interesting stories, with some still being unsolved to this day. I will be going over the 15 most horrifying crashes, and explain the tragic tale of each. Let's start off with number 15, the legendary Jim Clark. Up to this point, he had already cemented himself as one of the greatest in motorsport and was an icon in the paddock. In the season opener South African Grand Prix in 1968, he dominated and took the victory by a mile. It was obvious that if things continued the way it did, he would have won his third championship. During the four month gap in between round one and two, Clark was originally meant to race in a sports car race, but instead took part in a Formula 2 race due to contractual obligations. On the 7th of April 1968, during the race which consisted of two heats, Clark's Lotus went off course and collided with the trees on the 5th lap of the first heat. Unfortunately, he sustained severe injuries including a broken neck and a skull fracture, and tragically passed away prior to reaching the hospital. Although the exact cause of the crash was never conclusively determined, probable reason was a deflating tire. Despite this, other theories stated that the crash occurred due to a mechanical issue with the engine's metering unit, which had seized and potentially led to Clark's accident. Nonetheless, the death was mourned by many drivers and was a huge talent lost at the wheel. But at least Clark won two championships beforehand, which same couldn't be said about Jules Bianchi. The French driver was making waves in the sport, as despite having an uncompetitive car, he looked to be very fast and was considered a future star in the making. Sadly, that would all come to a halt at the 2014 Japanese Grand Prix. The race took place on October 5th in challenging weather conditions. During the race, on lap 43, Jules Bianchi lost control of his car and collided with a tractor crane that was attending the Adrian Suttles crash Sauber. Despite the presence of double-waved yellow flags, Bianchi was unable to slow down enough to avoid the accident. The impact caused significant damage to his car and the roll bar was destroyed. The tractor crane was also partially lifted off the ground, resulting in Soto's car falling back down. After this, the race was stopped and Lewis Hamilton was declared the winner. When he crashed, Jules Bianchi was found unconscious and did not respond to radio calls or marshals. He received immediate medical attention at the crash site before being transported to the circus medical center by ambulance. Due to the adverse weather conditions, he couldn't be transported by helicopter and had to travel 32 minutes under police escort to the nearest hospital, approximately 9.3 miles away from the circuit. Initial reports from Bianchi's father indicated that he had a critical head injury and was undergoing surgery to reduce severe bruising. The FIA also came out saying he had to be put in intensive care following the surgery. Tragically, Jules Bianchi passed away on July 17, 2015 at the age of 25 as a result of the injuries he sustained during the accident. His death marked the first time since Ayrton Senna's fatal accident in 1994 that a Formula 1 driver had been killed because of a crash and remains the last one ever. His family was devastated and so was Charles Leclerc who to this day remembers the support Bianchi gave him during his early career. Ferrari later revealed that Bianchi was going to be signed for Ferrari the following year following Alonso's resignation. But for the next incident, we need to go back to the 50s, specifically only 8 years since Formula 1's inauguration. During the 1958 Formula 1 season, Peter Collins drove for the Ferrari team but was under team orders to help his teammate Hawthorne win the title. Despite having a less competitive car, he showed his skill by winning the race at Great Britain. But unfortunately, a round later at Nürburgring, tragedy struck when Collins had a severe accident. He was pushing hard to maintain his pace when he entered the difficult section of the circuit at excessive speed. This caused his Ferrari to go off the track and encounter a ditch. Unable to regain control, Collins' car flipped in the air and landed upside down. He was ejected from the vehicle and collided with a tree, resulting in severe head injuries. Despite receiving medical attention, Collins passed away later that afternoon at a hospital. Teammate Mike Hawthorne, deeply affected by Collins' tragic death, made the decision to retire from racing immediately after securing the 1958 Drivers' Championship. However, his life was also cut short the following year in a terrible car accident. While this may have seemed terrible, this is only just the beginning. The strange thing about the next one is that it had to do with a mistake from the FIA. At the 1978 Italian Grand Prix at Monza, the standard procedure of a standing start was disrupted when the green lights went on too early. 
This resulted in cars in the rear row still running when the green light illuminated, and as a result, the cars in the back gained an advantage over those in the front, leading to a bunching effect as they approached the first chicane. The leading four drivers managed to avoid any complications due to their significant lead. However, Ronnie Peterson had a poor start from the third row and was swiftly overtaken by the others. While in 10th position, he veered to the right, crossing the line that separated the Grand Prix front straight and the approach to the old Monza banking. Although Jody Schechter managed to rejoin the track safely with a comfortable lead, Patrice re-entered just ahead of James Hunt. In response, Hunt made a sudden left maneuver, resulting in a collision with Peterson. This sent his Lotus car crashing heavily into the barriers and immediately catching fire. It then rebounded back onto the track, and Peterson became trapped inside the burning wreckage. James Hunt and two other drivers worked together to free him before the fire caused more severe burns. Meanwhile, track marshals were extinguishing the flames. Peterson was rescued and placed in the middle of the track, fully conscious but with severe leg injuries. Hunt prevented him from looking at his legs to spare him further distress. During the incident, there was greater concern for Brambilla, who had been struck on the head by a wheel and was unconscious in his car, so Peterson's life was initially not considered to be in immediate danger. Medical personnel attended to Brambilla's extraction from the wreckage first, and they were both sent and transported to a hospital in Milan. By the time he reached the hospital, he had around 27 fractures in his legs and feet, so after consultation, he was admitted to the intensive care unit for surgery to stabilize his bone. However, there was disagreement among the doctors about whether all fractures should be addressed immediately. Unfortunately, Peterson's condition deteriorated overnight, and he was diagnosed with a fat embolism. By morning, his kidneys had failed completely, and he was pronounced dead at 9.55 a.m. on September 11, 1978. This moment still haunts Mario Andretti, who clinched the championship that day but couldn't celebrate because of the tragedy. Also, Peterson managed to secure the second place in the championship after death that year. But have you heard of the driver that won the championship after death? His name was Jochen Rindt, and he was ready to compete for the title eight years previous in 1970. Despite a poor start to the season due to an unreliable car, he would pick himself back up and win in Monaco, Netherlands, France, Great Britain, and Germany to put up a commendable lead in the standings. During the Italian Grand Prix at Monza, a track known for its high speeds, teams like Lotus decided to remove the rear wings from their cars to minimize drag and gain an additional speed boost by utilizing slipstreams. Rin's teammate, John Miles, wasn't pleased with the wingless setup during Friday's practice session, experiencing difficulties keeping the car stable. However, Rint didn't encounter such problems and mentioned that the car was nearly 800 RPM faster on the streets without the wings, according to Chapman's recollection. The next day, Rint adjusted his car's gear ratios to capitalize on the reduced drag, enabling a higher potential top speed. But on his fifth lap during practice, Rint suffered a severe crash while approaching the Parabolica corner. During the crash, one of the joints in the crash barrier came apart, causing the vehicle's suspension to go beneath the barrier and collide head-on with a stanchion, causing the front of the car to be completely destroyed. Rint had a habit of using only 4 out of the 5 points on the available harness and didn't fasten the crotch straps, as he wanted a quick exit option in case of a fire. Unfortunately, upon impact, he slid under the belts, and the belts themselves caused a fatal injury by slitting Rint's throat. Subsequent investigations revealed that the accident was initially triggered by a failure in the car's inboard brake shaft. However, it was determined that Rint's death was ultimately caused by poorly installed crash barriers. He was pronounced dead on the way to the hospital in Milan. But this is where the real story begins, as it still wasn't over for Rint. Since he had a huge margin in the championship at the time, his rivals needed to get nearly perfect results in order to take the title from Rint. While Jackie Ix and the Ferrari team was catching up to Rint's lead, a victory at the United States Grand Prix from his replacement Emerson Fittipaldi saw him secure the championship after death, becoming the only driver in history to ever win the championship posthumously. Also, Ronnie Peterson named his daughter after Rint's wife, and both ironically died on the same track. But, this accident is definitely not as well known as that of Ayrton Senna. The 1994 San Marino Grand Prix proved to be one of the darkest weekends in Formula 1. 
Ayrton Senna, who had failed to finish the first two races, saw this event as the start of his season and aimed to win the championship with 14 remaining races. Williams made modifications to their cars to enhance their performance at Imola. During the Saturday qualifying session, Roland Ratzenberger, an Australian rookie, tragically lost his life when his front wing broke at the Villeneuve corner, causing a high-speed crash into the concrete retaining wall. Ayrton Senna, deeply affected by the incident, immediately went to the accident scene in the medical center. FIA Medical Chief Professor Sid Watkins, who shared a passion for fishing with Senna, advised the tearful driver to retire from racing and pursue fishing instead. However, Senna responded that he couldn't give up racing. At the beginning of the Grand Prix, Ayrton Senna successfully maintained his lead ahead of his main competitor, Michael Schumacher. After a safety car on lap 6 of the race, the Grand Prix resumed and Ayrton Senna quickly set a fast pace, recording the third fastest lap of the race, closely followed by Michael Schumacher. However, on lap 7, as Senna approached the timber at the corner at a high speed of around 191 miles per hour, his car veered off the racing line and collided with the concrete retaining wall. The severity of the crash led to the race being red flagged, and within a short time, Ayrton Senna was extracted from his car by the medical team. Immediate medical attention was provided at the car's side, as Senna had a weak heartbeat and had suffered significant blood loss, approximately 4.5 liters of blood, which accounted for 90% of his blood volume. Due to Senna's critical neurological condition, he was urgently requested an airlift to a hospital in Bologna under Gordini's supervision. At 6.40 p.m. local time, the head of the hospital's emergency department, Maria Teresa Fiandri, announced Senna's passing. Although the official time of the death under Italian law was declared as 2.17 p.m., corresponding to the moment of impact when Senna's brain ceased functioning. The right front wheel and the suspension of the car were propelled towards the cockpit during the accident, striking Senna on the right side of his helmet and forcefully pushing his head against the headrest. A part of the wheel's upright assembly had partially penetrated his helmet, causing a significant indentation in his forehead. Additionally, it was observed that a sharp fragment from the upright assembly had penetrated the helmet visor just above his right eye. As a result, Senna suffered fatal skull fractures, severe brain injuries, and had a ruptured temporal artery, which is a major blood vessel that supplies blood to the face and scalp. According to experts, any one of these three injuries would have likely been fatal. But most importantly, the crash wasn't the scary part, but rather the loss of such a great driver. To many people at the time, Senna was the greatest, and to this very day, he is still regarded as the greatest of all time. And this couldn't be further proven than when approximately 3 million individuals gathered in the streets of Sao Paulo, Senna's hometown, to pay their respects and honor him. This event is widely acknowledged as the largest documented gathering of mourners in recent histories. Senna's crash was mourned by many in the 90s, but going back to the 50s, many people were grieving the death of another champion, Alberto Ascari. He had won two world championships at the time, and in the race before his fatal crash, he was distracted and fell into the harbor at Monaco, but swam up safely. But then, on the 26th of May 1955, he went to Monza to watch his friend Eugenio Castellotti test a Ferrari sports car. They were meant to co-drive the car in the 100km Mazda race in a couple days, having been given special permission. Although, Ascari was not supposed to drive that day but still decided to try a few laps. In his jacket and tie, shirt sleeves, ordinary trousers, and Castellotti's white helmet, he set off. As he emerged from a fast curve on the third lap, the car inexplicably skidded, turned on its nose, and the car flipped twice. Thrown out onto the track, Ascari suffered multiple injuries and died a few minutes later. The crash occurred on one of the track's challenging high-speed corners, which was renamed in his honor, now called Variante Ascari. Although, an even scarier crash was that of Stuart Lewis Evans. This individual was an English racing driver from Britain who took part in 14 Formula 1 races, making his debut on May 19, 1957. The 1958 Formula 1 season was a successful one for the Vanwell team initially. Sterling Moss, Tony Brooks, and Lewis Evans achieved three victories each, with Lewis Evans also securing podium finishes in the Belgian and Portuguese races. He even earned pole position at the Dutch Grand Prix, although he did not finish that race. But then, tragically, during the season-ending Moroccan Grand Prix, 
Lewis Evans was involved in a severe crash at the Dusty Circuit. His Van Wells engine seized, causing him to collide with the barriers at high speed, resulting in a fiery accident. He was airlifted back to the UK, but died to his burns in the hospital six days later. Lewis Evans' untimely death deeply affected the Van Wall team, overshadowing their victory in the 1958 International Cup for F1 manufacturers, now called the Constructors' Championship, in which Lewis Evans had played a significant role. Following the tragedy, Van Der Vel, the team's owner, never fully recovered and decided to withdraw from motorsport at the end of the season. Sadly, the death of Lewis Evans was straightforward, but someone with a bit more interesting fatality was Alan Stacey. During the 1960 Belgian Grand Prix at spa Frankershops, Stacey lost his life at the wheel while driving his Lotus. He was struck in the face by a bird at a speed of 120 miles per hour on the 25th lap, with this unfortunate incident occurring while he was in 6th place. His car veered off the road at the Bernenville corner, where a cross and embarkment crashed through thick hedges and ended up in a nearby field. Tragically, he passed away shortly after the crash not far from another fatal accident involving Chris Bristol. In a later accident, Stacy's friend and teammate, Innes Ireland, mentioned that some witnesses believed the bird hitting Stacy's face may have rendered him unconscious or even caused a fatal injury before the crash. Other than this, there is no more information about the crash, but it was still very horrific nonetheless. Now moving on to number 6, we will talk about Joe Siffert. The Swiss racing driver was very good, winning the last race by a private team in Formula 1. Unfortunately, he lost his life during a non-championship race at Brands Hatch. His BRM car had its suspension damaged in a collision with Ronnie Peterson during the first lap, and later the suspension broke, which in turn saw the BRM crash and immediately catch fire. During the subsequent investigation by the Royal Automobile Club, it was discovered that Siffert initially suffered a leg fracture in the crash. However, due to the failure of three fire extinguishers, rescuers were unable to reach him for five minutes, and he tragically died due to smoke inhalation. A fire marshal stated that if the fire extinguishers had worked properly, they could have reached Siffert within 20 seconds. This accident prompted significant safety reforms both in terms of in-car and on-circuit measures. Mandatory onboard fire extinguishers were introduced, along with provision of piped air directly into the driver's helmets. His funeral in Switzerland drew a crowd of 50,000 people. Siffert suffered a pretty ugly death, but it's nothing compared to the rest on this list. In the next one, we talk about one that has been previously stated, but often overshadowed by Senna's crash, Roland Ratzenberger. In 1994, Ratzenberger fulfilled his dream of becoming one of the few Austrian drivers in Formula 1. During the winter of 1993-1994, through 1994, he secured a sponsorship from a wealthy German woman, which led to a deal with a newly established Simtech team for five races. Even though Ratzenberger's car was not competitive, he did pretty decent results considering the circumstances, but sadly, he would not start his third race in Formula 1. At the notorious 1994 San Marino Grand Prix, during the second qualifying session, Ratzenberger had an accident after going off the track at the Equa Minerali chicane. Despite the damage to his front wing from a previous spin, he continued driving, unaware of the extent of the damage. Tragically, while attempting to turn at high speed, his broken front wing caused the crash into the outside wall at a speed of 195.7 miles per hour. The impact of the crash was severe, measuring about 500 g, which is the highest g-force recorded in Formula 1 history. He was immediately taken to the medical center at the Imola circuit and later airlifted to Maggiore Hospital in Bologna. Unfortunately, upon arrival at the hospital, he was pronounced dead. The official cause of his death was determined to be a basilar skull fracture, along with blunt trauma caused by the front left tire penetrating the car's survival cell. This crash left a huge mark on the drivers at the time, since there hadn't been a fatal accident in a decade. Little did they know that a day later, they would see the biggest loss in Formula 1. Rewinding 12 years, we would see Jules Villeneuve, often considered the fastest Formula 1 driver in history, having a bad start to the 1982 season. In 1979, he lost out on the title against Schechter, and then in 1982, he would find a new rival, Didier Peroni. With Renault's drivers retiring, Ferrari appeared to have a guaranteed victory. To conserve fuel and ensure both cars finished, the Ferrari team instructed their drivers to slow down. However, a misunderstanding arose between Villeneuve and his teammate Peroni. 
Vilner believed that the order meant they should maintain their positions, but Peroni overtook him. Vilner then repassed Peroni but then slowed down, thinking Peroni was simply entertaining the crowd. Although, on the final lap, Peroni aggressively passed Vilner and crossed in front of him to claim the win. Vilner was furious, feeling that Peroni had disobeyed the order to hold position. Peroni defended his actions, stated that the team had only instructed him to slow down, but not maintain positions. This incident led to Vilner vowing never to speak to Peroni again, feeling betrayed and angry. But most importantly, this would start a chain reaction that would eventually see his demise. On May 8th, 1982, it was qualifying for the Belgian Grand Prix and he was competing against his teammate for 6th place, with Peroni having a slightly faster time. Vilner was using his last set of qualifying tires and there are conflicting views regarding his intentions on his final lap. Some believe he was simply trying to improve his time, while others suggest he was specifically aiming to outperform Peroni. Nonetheless, with only 8 minutes remaining in the session, Villeneuve encountered Joachim Mass, who was moving slowly through a left-handed bend before a double right-hand section. Both drivers attempted to navigate around each other, however, their movements coincided, resulting in Villeneuve's Ferrari colliding with the back of Mass's car. The impact launched Villeneuve's car into the air, estimated to be traveling at a speed of 124 to 140 miles per hour. It remained airborne for over 100 meters before crashing and disintegrating along the edge of the track. Villeneuve, still in his seat but without his helmet, was thrown an additional 50 meters from the wreckage into the cash fence outside the corner. Several fellow drivers quickly came to the scene and pulled Villeneuve from a cash fence, noticing that his face had turned blue. Medical assistance arrived within 35 seconds, and although Villeneuve had a pulse, he was not breathing. He was intubated and ventilated before being transported to the Circuit Medical Center and then by helicopter to the University's St. Raphael Hospital in Leuven. There, doctors diagnosed a fatal neck fracture. Wilner was kept on life support while his wife traveled to the hospital and consulted with specialists worldwide. He ultimately passed away at 3.20 p.m. EST. Derek Ungaro, the safety inspector, led an inquiry into the accident. The investigation determined that Villeneuve's error led to the collision with Mass's car and cleared Mass of any responsibility for the incident. Nonetheless, it was a huge loss of a great racer. And unfortunately, we would see an almost guaranteed world champion lose his life, Wolfgang von Trips. He is one of the lesser appreciated drivers despite being such a big influence to young drivers and almost securing a title. If it wasn't for his tragic accident at the 1961 Italian Grand Prix. On September 10th, Von Trips was engaged in a fierce competition with his teammate Phil Hill for the Formula 1 World Drivers Championship. Unfortunately, during the race at Monza, his Ferrari collided with Jim Clark's Lotus. This collision caused Von Trips' car to become airborne and crash into a side barrier, resulting in his fatal ejection from the vehicle. Tragically, 15 spectators also lost their lives in the incident with later movie footage revealing that Von Tripp's car had actually ridden up an embankment and collided with a fence where spectators were densely gathered. Von Tripp's was leading the Formula 1 World Championship at the time of his death, but the unfortunate turn of events would cause his teammate Phil Hill to cruise to victory that season, beating Von Tripp's and taking the title. Now, it is time to go over one of the worst crashes. This is my warning that the content can be graphic. So now that you are aware, let me talk about the incident with Tom Price. He had a difficult start to the 1977 South African Grand Prix, finding himself in last place after the first lap. But impressively, by the 18th lap, Price had managed to climb from 22nd position to 13th place. During the 22nd lap, Zorzi encountered a problem with his fuel metering unit, leading to fuel being pumped directly onto the engine, resulting in a fire. Positioned on the left side of the main straight, just after a hill and a track bridge, Zorzi was unable to disconnect the oxygen pipe from his helmet, preventing him from immediately exiting the car. Observing the situation, two marshals from the pit while on the opposite side of the track took action. The first marshal, Bill, a 25-year-old panel beater, bravely crossed the track, followed by Frederick Jansen von Veren, a 19-year-old who carried a 40-pound fire extinguisher. Sadly, the second marshal wasn't very lucky, and Price would get struck by the fire extinguisher at an insane speed of 170 miles per hour. The collision with the fire extinguisher caused Price's helmet to be forcefully thrown upward, resulting in his instantaneous death. Tragically, Price's lifeless body remained behind the wheel of his car, 
which continued to travel at a high speed down the main straight towards the first corner known as Crowthorn. The car deviated from the track to the right, scrapping against the metal barriers and colliding with an emergency vehicle entrance before returning onto the track. Subsequently, it collided head-on with Jack Lafitte's leisure, leading both Price and Lafitte to crash into the barriers. Price's death was met with great grief from all those who knew him, and he was honored for many years as an exceptional star that was gone too soon. In regards to the marshal that was tragically killed in the middle of the track, he was forcefully propelled into the air and landed a short distance ahead of Zorzi's car. Tragically, he lost his life instantly upon impact and his body suffered severe injuries caused by the collision with Price's car. The severity of his injuries was such that initially his body remained unidentified until after the race director called all the race marshals together, and he was discovered to be absent among them. That weekend was no doubt the most disgraceful race in Formula 1 history. And now, for number 1 on the list, it is up to you, the viewer, to decide what your worst crash was. Was it the death of Senna, or the tragic loss of Joe Bianchi? Or maybe someone else I didn't mention in this video, like Francois Severe or Lorenzo Bandini, so let me know if you would have put that in the list. While Formula 1 has seen its fair shares of dangers and fatalities in the past, the sport has made significant strides to improve safety measures. Through continuous advancements in technology, track design, and driver protection, the aim is to prevent such tragic events from occurring again. Today, Formula 1 prioritizes the well-being of its drivers and spectators, implementing rigorous safety protocols to ensure a safer racing environment. Although the sport acknowledges its history, it strives to move forward, embracing progress and aspiring for a future where such heartbreaking events will remain a thing of the past. Hope you enjoyed! I made a detailed video on the deaths of Jakin Rint and Jules Villeneuve, which you can click on your screen right now. See you there!